calling this meeting of the Board of Education <coughs> to order. Ms. Jasinski, can you please call the roll? The, call the roll. Thank you. Ms. Here. Mr. Here. Ms. Thank you. I uh, will everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Solon. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fabiani. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to open this evening's meeting recognizing uh, somebody dear to our community, to our high school staff that passed away uh, two weeks ago. And uh, Megumi Yamamoto had been more than a teacher at Cheshire High School. She had been an inspiration to generations of students uh, as well as peers. In 2012, she was recognized by our school system as the Cheshire Public Schools Teacher of the Year and ultimately was a finalist for Connecticut State Teacher of the Year. I know that you'll join me in mourning the loss to our community and I appreciate you uh, honoring her with a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Solon. Um, and again, Mr. Solon, um, I'm gonna leave it to you to introduce Kristen Pels. Sure. Now it's, you know, difficult to go from such moments of, of lows <clears throat> to really, for me, what amounts to one of the absolute highlights of Board of Education meetings throughout our year, and that's the reports that we receive from representatives uh, from the students at Cheshire High School. So to introduce our Board of Education representatives, for 1819, I welcome our CHS, one of our assistant principals, Ms. Kristen Pels. Good evening. So tonight the Board of Ed, uh, the Board welcomes the, um, the student representatives for the 2018-2019 school year, Alessandra DePaolo and Ayan Bhattachahari. Um, after um, introductions, the representatives will present a report on the events and activities taking place at the high school. Ion is an exceptional young man. He is highly intelligent, creative, motivated, determined, and committed to making the most out of his high school and college years. Ion has continually challenged himself academically, taking the most rigorous curriculum at Cheshire High School. His stellar grades have earned him an astounding grade point average of 4.9, placing him at the very top of his class. Teachers comment that Ion is a bright, hardworking student with significant abilities in a variety of areas. He understands abstract concepts and can, can apply them with ease. He challenges himself to a high level coursework and works consistently to achieve very high quality results. He always emerges as one of the top students of his class. As depicted in his vast resume, Ian has been a strong contributing member to the high school community. He seeks out opportunities to enhance his knowledge and leadership skills on a regular basis. He is the current president of the, of the Model United Nations and Young Democrats, and is the president and founder of the Star Wars Force for Change Club. In addition, he is an avid, clar avid clarinet player and has worked as a research intern at Yale University. His school counselor says with complete certainty that Ian will succeed in setting and reaching his goals. This young man will be a strong contributor to any school and community and will without a doubt make his mark on this world. So welcome Ian. Alessandra, or uh, Allie, has a very warm personality and strong sense of self. Allie thrives at Cheshire High School and has made her mark. Academically, Allie has consistently challenged herself in a strong college preparatory program. Allie is an extremely conscientious young lady who cares very deeply about her work. 
She is very passionate about learning and always displays an optimistic and outgoing attitude. Allie sets very high goals for herself and never shies away from hard work. Her focus is not limited to academics. Throughout high school, she has been extremely involved in extracurricular activities, as is evidenced by her extensive resume. Allie is a competitive dancer, which takes up a significant amount of her time. In addition, she, in addition, she is vice president of her class and holds leadership roles in National Honor Society and Link Crew. She is also heavily involved in her church, which has spurred her desire to seek out community service opportunities. Allie is a leader in words and actions. She is an outstanding role member for her peers. So welcome, Allie. Now they'll give their reports. Thank you very much for that introduction, Mrs. Pels. I know, I know I'm not the only one who feels like a complete slacker in high school after hearing about you guys. And I know that you have prepared a report for the board, so I'll pass it off to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to start and talk about the sports here. We talked to Mr. Trafone, the athletic directors, director. So. Um, we're coming to the end of the regular fall season and turning into tournament time. So this postseason is starting soon, which means a lot of teams are having senior nights. So a lot of our friends are actually celebrating, and we've gotten to see a couple. Um, the league postseason starts in October, and November is the um, state postseason of the SEC. Um, also, I believe it was – oh, no. So there's, uh, Mr. Trifone is, has been invited to attend a sportsmanship conference that the CIA – CIAC is hosting, and he plans on bringing several students to talk about what to do to promote good sportsmanship in the school and community. So that's something he's really excited about for next month. Also, yesterday, um, all sports captains attended a leadership conference or leadership council meeting where they discussed promoting positive leadership, what to look for in leaders, and how to become better leaders in school and on sports teams. Um, and also, lots of the Cheshire High School teams are doing really well. Some of the best teams are the teams that have the best records right now is boys soccer, field hockey, girls swimming, and girls volleyball. Um, bringing a little bit out to the school, the uh, annual pep rally is next Friday. So we'll be celebrating some of the sports captains and, as well as the band and other school teams. Um, and with that, some school groups have been creating t-shirts with one of the CTE teachers down in the basement, Mr. McEwen, to creates cool spirit. So the student lead, student section sport captain or student section captains at the football games are designing or designed blackout, whiteout, and um, pink out t shirts that people are buying for ten dollars each and get to wear and the whole student section has the same shirt on and it looks really awesome. So that's something to look to um, look out for if you ever end up at one, one of those. Also Best Buddies used it to make T shirts for the red out, which was last last football game. Um, I want to thank Mrs. Powell's for her kind words as well and the administration for this opportunity. Um, moving on to some other things um, outside of sports, um, this Monday um, we had the first Cheshire Chat at Cheshire High School, an initiative Dr. Gad started last year. Um, we went over the results of some of the performance standards surveys and assessing student understanding of those performance standards, which was started again last year, um, and recently um, the opportunity for students to um, participate in the NEASC accredit accreditation process um, has also gone out. I believe Mrs. Powell sent out that survey, or Dr. Reed sent out that survey today as well. Um, currently, parent conferences are going on, but thankfully as seniors, we don't have to do that. Um, <laughs> there's also a college fair tonight um, at 6, 6 p.m., which is, I assume, going on right now. Um, and the student organized blood drive is also tomorrow. Um, and I know they've been at the lunches promoting it, asking a lot of people to sign up, so that's very good. Um, as Mrs. Powell's mentioned, the, the annual rally hosted by the Cheshire High School Young Democrats is also tomorrow. Um, it's at the Senior Center um, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, next Tuesday, Miss um, Altman, a Holocaust survivor, will be in the library from 11 to 12.30. Um, speaking about her experiences, and I imagine a lot of the history classes um, will go to see her there. Um, PSAT day has been moved to October 24th. Um, it's a half day, and seniors and freshmen um, who will not be taking the examination are be doing team building activities and um, will be attending an assembly with a guest speaker and also um, uh, going through another College 101 presentation. 
Um, the Halloween parade um, that, that's annual um, is on, on the 31st, as would be expected. Um, NHS induction has been rescheduled to November 7th. And um, as you all know, all the, sen the seniors um, right now are looking forward to college deadlines um, coming up on November 1st and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, and welcome to the uh, Board of Ed. We appreciate uh, the time that you guys will take in reporting to us um, every month. So does anyone have, to any have questions? Have you come up and greet oh, yeah. the board as well. Can, can we ask a question first? Sure. Just about uh, I and the, the blood drive. Yes. Is that only for students to participate? So a board of ed member could come by the high school and give blood tomorrow? Just got to sign in at the main office, yep. Yeah. Great, thank okay. you. Well, yes, come up and be welcomed. Okay, um, Ms. Harrigan, do you have a motion for us? I certainly do. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll wait. Okay. We have a school partnership award. I apologize for that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, at this time, I would like to call up uh, Mrs. Karen Hayes, who is the recipient of the School Partnership Award for Highland School. Mrs. Hayes is a valued member of the Highland community. Karen is a parent of three children, Ryan grade seven, Luke grade five, and Quinn grade three. And they're all here, good. <laughs> In addition, Karen is an active member of the Highland PTO, serving on a variety of committees, including the family dinner night. Karen also serves as a literacy volunteer, reading with students in different grade levels. Karen has been nominated for the 2018 School Partnership Award for her work with the Highland Career Day. She has served on the committee for several years before serving as the chairperson for the last two years. Each year, she recruits over 40 volunteers from the Highland and Cheshire community to share their occupation with our students. Karen begins the process of recruiting career volunteers early in the year. Her work includes recruiting, scheduling, and communicating with each presenter to ensure all students have an experience that is authentic and engaging. We thank Karen for all she does for the Highland community and for going above and beyond for the children of Cheshire Public Schools. Thank you so much. And this, we have some presents. Come on over here. Yeah, come over here. And, and the great blankie. Yes. Here, right in the middle. <laughs> Sorry. That's Sorry. My favorite. Yes. Stay over here. Okay, ready? You'll take it to one. We'll leave for you. No problem. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I thought somebody else was getting in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks, huh? <laughs> Thank you and congratulations, Mrs. Hayes. Now, Mrs. Harrigan, do you have a motion for us? I do. Um, I move that the Cheshire Board of Education approve the minutes of the Board of Education meeting held September 20th, 2018. Is there a second? Mrs. Sobel, any comments, corrections, questions? Uh, so the motion before us is that the Cheshire Board of Education approve the minutes of the Board of Education meeting held September 20, 2018. All those in favor? 
and it is unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Perugini, do we have any correspondence this evening? Madam Chair, unfortunately, there is no correspondence this evening. Thank you. Mr. Solon, do you have a report for us? I do. Thank you very much, Ms. Fabiani. Um, the Quite a few things that I'd like to cover, seeing as we haven't met in a while. Uh, first is the Communication Steering Committee. Uh, we've put together quite a group of folks uh, from our town manager, Mr. Kimball, to uh, one of our, our high school students, a diverse group to uh, represent all of the interests and perspectives that exist in our community. And next week we'll be conducting a survey to gather information around what our community would like to know about our schools and how would they would like to receive that information. The survey was generated by that communication steering committee. And as I said, the committee includes a dozen people with various backgrounds from, on our community from uh, a Cheshire High student to the town manager. And we look forward to reviewing our community feedback and designing a plan to support our sharing information with the Cheshire community. Um, I don't know if you saw this morning on CBS Morning News uh, that they highlighted an updated school crisis response program called ALICE. ALICE stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. The premise of the program is that it's time to build on the initial response to a crisis situation, which often consists, consists of simply closing the door and hiding in a corner. On Thursday, October 4th, several members of our district security team attended a two-day ALICE training. Attendees at the training included Cheshire police officers, district administrators, and facilities supervisors. It's difficult to get over the notion that an active sh shooter on our school grounds is something we need to prepare for. With that reality, though, we want to make sure that we're using the best options for our people to respond and remain safe. So we will continue to explore how to enhance our security measures, which will likely mean a deeper conversation around Alice, and I'll certainly keep you posted on that. Uh, as you know, we have two focal areas for our district uh, that we're really trying to improve upon. One is complex thinking, and the way that we're um, really focused on that this year is through learning walks. Our administrative team has continued um, to engage in that process. Uh, we're looking to ultimately bring teachers into the fold and use that to support our professional growth. Our, we've spent more time as an administrative group focused on what good instruction looks like around complex thinking this year um, than I can remember in, in the last decade. We've observed a ton of classrooms across the district and we're honing our conversations around how do we support students in engaging in complex work and how do we ensure that they're learning those complex thinking skills. And so we look forward to working with teachers in the future. And I, I know I've shared some of the survey results with you in the past that our teachers are looking forward to that process as well, which is exciting. The other goal are around social emotional learning. I want to acknowledge our purple pu pupil, excuse me, no, she's not purple. She is our pupil personnel director, <laughs> however, uh, Tracy Hussey, and she recently spearheaded a district effort to secure a grant from the United Way uh, for the One Word, One Voice program. That's a two-year grant worth about $20,000, and it supports our efforts in providing training around emotional health and suicide prevention. This dovetails with recent efforts such as training all of our bus drivers in mental health first aid, and we've already begun training our uh, support staff, our PPS staff, in uh, threat assessment and supporting students that are having emotional difficulty. So uh, I, I think we're making great progress in that respect. Uh, personalized Learning Task Force update. Uh, the Personalized Learning Task Force has worked diligently since last April to examine how we meet our district goals to address personalized learning. The work has focused on creating a vision of what we want for our graduates and a definition of what we can agree upon to be personalized learning. Those drafts have been created and will be shared with the community at the Cheshire High School Auditorium on Tuesday, October 23rd from 7 to 8.30 p.m. I've already sent 
uh, emails to our parents and faculty. So this is hopefully another way to, to notify the community. That presentation will be recorded and available on our website as soon as possible after the 23rd. A survey soliciting feedback will accompany that presentation. Uh, the, the feedback that we're seeking is really around those two draft definitions that we have. And I appreciate the work of our committee who's very diverse in, in perspective um, and role in the community and, and in their you know, backgrounds. And they spent a lot of time on this and actually unanimously endorsed both um, definitions. So that, that tells me that you know, they're really on the right track, but we're looking forward to uh, soliciting community feedback to see what, what people think of those definitions and if there's anything that we need to adjust. But now that the definitions are being finalized, the task force is exploring the, the missteps during the summit implementation, and we will ultimately be making recommendations about how to avoid similar circumstances in the future. Those recommendations will be reviewed with the community at, at future presentations probably throughout the winter. Um, just a couple of quick notes. The CABE Convention, uh, Connecticut Association of Boards of Education, for those of you who may not know, they, they do a, a convention every November uh, in conjunction with the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents. It'll be held Friday, November 16th at the Mystic Marriott. If any board members are interested in attending, please let Carol know ASAP. There's usually a lot of great information in that, that meeting down there. Um, the budget meetings, something for everybody to look forward to, uh, have been established for the 1819, excuse me, 1920 budget season. Hard to wrap your head around. Um, and the my budget presentation to the board will, was moved to Tuesday, January 8th, and I just want to make sure everybody is aware of that on the board and in the community. A schedule, a complete schedule of the meetings is uh, in our agenda. It'll be available on our website as well. Um, one of the highlights of the year, every year, is the CAP Superintendents Awards uh, dinner that we have. Um, so please mark your calendar for November 14th at 6 p.m. in the Dodd Cafeteria where we have another amazing group of students from around the district. Um, and they're, they're so much fun. There's a lot of personality in this year's group. And so I, I hope you have the opportunity to attend. If you could please let Carol know if you could be there or not. Um, it is a really fun night, and it's a great opportunity to celebrate with our kids and our community. Finally, on a down note, snow, uh, we held our emergency snow uh, closing meeting uh, this, this week with administrators, members from the police department, public works, fire and transportation, to review our school closing procedures and it's amazing how much goes into it and we start at you know about 4 30 in the morning talking to meteorologists and the public works and, and police and everything i just want to take a moment to acknowledge all of our friends uh on this side of the street in the public works and the police department i mean i, I remember last year I'm sure they weren't driving, but I was getting text photos of streets in Cheshire, you know, at different places to, to be able to better assess what's going on. So thank you to all of our friends that work for uh, the town of Cheshire that support us in the, the difficult decisions around whether or not we postpone or cancel school uh, on snow days. So that's all I have. I don't know if there are any questions. I'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you, Mr. Solon. Are there any questions for the superintendent? Um, <clears throat> you have several questions, um, as usual, right? Um, firstly, the, um, the composition of the communications task force, um, I, and it's not meant to be anything personal to Marlena, um, but I noticed that she, she's listed as a parent on the task force, and I was just wondering, is, is that her official capacity, or is she there as a sitting board member? There's no real, you know, capacity. Yes, I can't take, you know, she's a board member. Um, if there, if it wasn't listed on there, that would just be an error. I mean, she is a board member and a parent. It, it there, yeah. Oh, well, I just want, because, you know, we did have a communications committee. Right. And so if we were to have another sitting board member, shouldn't it be someone from the communicate? I know 
you know, Catherine is there, obviously, as the chairman of the community communications committee. Yes. And I would have expected her to be there. But um, I wasn't I was a little surprised to see another sitting board member on there. I thought it was meant to have one board member and then uh, members of the community on there. So I was just curious as to how that came about. Sure. She requested if she could attend and it wasn't a problem with the facilitator. I know, like, for example, I know you can't attend the next one, but um, she did attend the last one. So it was a matter of just you were, because I you know, like, we've had, we always have committee meetings where members will, will attend. I was just wondering if, if Marle Marlena was there as, a, as a, a member of the community attending or if she was a participating member, because I know sometimes we can go but not participate. We can listen, you know. I, I, if I can just jump in here. Sure. I asked to go because it was an interest of mine. I also run a nonprofit. I'm a parent. It sounded like an interesting uh, subject to me. I wasn't looking at it in terms of uh, w because we're because we're doing it as a task force. I wasn't thinking that I was one more person to represent the board per se. It was just an opportunity to to find out more about it. Well, no, I meant it as I wasn't sure if Jeff had appointed you or, no, or if, if how that was com you know how that came about. That's all. I was just wondering uh, as to you know who was the if Catherine is just the appointed board member for the community and you were just there as a you know, a concerned citizen. It's just, you know. I was there as an interested party. An I just asked party. if I could attend. Okay. And then um, I guess my, my second question, uh, I guess, goes to the personalized learning task force. Um, you, you said that, um, you know, we're going to have the, uh, the presentation next week. Um, and I'm guessing the format will, I don't know if you, you'll be presenting or how that will go about. And I'm assuming as board members will show up and just be part of the crowd, I guess. Yes. Um, and yeah. and you said that they would uh, they would also make recommendations further down the line um, about the, the summit program, that sort of thing. And, and are those recommendations going to be presented to the curriculum committee or how, what is the what is the format going forward? Because, you know, you said you, you would like to have public comment. Is that going to be uh, take place during the curriculum committee or is that a public comment? At, at a board meeting or w when does that public comment occur for any of sure. this? That's a good question. So on the 23rd, the community w will open the uh, feedback period on our definition of personalized learning and our vision of the graduate. We'll open that, I mean, we'll, we'll keep that open for a couple of weeks once we get the video available online to provide ample, ample opportunity for feedback around those definitions. Then we'll present that to the curriculum committee of the board uh, for information review and then the full board. The, um, in, in that format, I think you, you might have asked what the format was there with respect to the presentation. Yeah, myself, uh, or Mr. Parkhurst would be delivering that presentation. Uh, it's, it's a PowerPoint presentation accompanied with a handout. Uh, and we did that too, knowing that not everybody could be there to hear everything. And the handout that the, the committee uh, created is more comprehensive. So it really accompanies the presentation. And then the, there's a, a survey monkey survey at the end. Um, or a Google survey, um, but the the next step would be our committee, our task force is reviewing the you know some of the missteps of Summit. We we had a meeting already where we talked about what some of those concerns were from various perspectives, whether it be uh, teachers and parents and students and uh, administrators. Compiled some of that feedback at our next task force meeting. We're going to talk about what to do to avoid any of those challenges in the future uh, and then ultimately develop a plan around that to share for feedback across the community before coming back to the um, curriculum committee and the board again. So uh, just like the next phase of the work. And what form will the feedback take? That, that's something that I d develop with the task force. Um, the task force developed the feedback process for the definitions. It's a collective effort. 
um, and we haven't designed the feedback process yet for that next phase. Can I, um, maybe I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but on October 23rd, after the presentation, is there going to be an opportunity for people to make comments at that point, or, or is the feedback going to be solicited as a post-presentation matter? It, the feedback is around uh, the definitions, mm -hmm. and there can be conversation at the end of the presentation, but the feedback we're collecting is through an uh, online survey. Okay. And that'll be available as a link on our website, as well as in the moment right there at that, at that presentation for the definitions. And then, as I said, we'd enter the next phase where we're talking about, you know, other, other issues beyond the, the definitions. That's all for now. Thank you, Mr. Grippo. Tony has a question. Mr. Perugini. Yeah, I'll just keep Jeff going. I got a question. In all, in all seriousness, uh, I, I think it was the last meeting one prior. We're going to have an opportunity. I, I, I know the task force is doing a lot of good work. I hear it in the community. I hear it through, through here. Can't attend some of those meetings. I'll try to be here the 23rd, but um, I would love at some point when they're satisfied with definitions and if we can get them to come to the board meeting. Sure. And have them present definitions to us, maybe have a little dialogue and just you know, put faces to the names. And sure. Yeah, just yeah, we'll definitely invite them to, to, to you know be a part of that. I know some people are very comfortable speaking like oh, that, right. and other people right. might be quiet supporters in the back. But we we'll certainly we're invite easy. them. We we I know you. Yeah. You're no, it would be nice to. It's crowd, like yeah. work, and as this thing's coalescing, it, you know, especially well, the definition phase. You know, I'd love to hear them present it. And yeah, I, you know, they have put a lot of work into this, so I I think it's also an opportunity for a collective body here to acknowledge that effort. I mean, the, the time they put in, I mean, Adam's been to a couple of those meetings, Catherine, you know, it, it's a lot that they've put into it. And uh, it's because they all care deeply about our community and what happens for our students. So it's nice to acknowledge them too. Oh, I agree. It's also- Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's more for the board of it to yep. be close to that since it's come for us at some point. Sure. Yeah, it'd be nice to get some follow. Great, thank you. Anyone else have any questions for the superintendent? Ms. Sobel, do you have a report for us from the Finance Committee? I do, Ms. Fabiani, thank you. Um, we are, uh, I'm glad that we are projecting to end the fiscal year in a balance. Uh, this report is, is a little more complete and more reflective of our full year financial picture than the August report as it does include the initial encumbrances for payroll and transportation services accounts. Uh, there are no major budget concerns to report, which is very good. Um, nonetheless, we, again, I said this last month, but we also uh, are continuing to begin the fiscal year with the district-wide requirement in place not to expend more than 60% of budget for our non-payroll accounts through November and then we will raise that to 70, hopefully in January, 80 through March, and then 100% for June uh, 2019. Um, and this, this month, um, Mr. Massiana is here. Do you wanna give the medical benefits update? Absolutely, good evening, everyone. The medical benefits report is in the board members package and the good news here is that we had 512,000 in claims in the month of September, which is unusually low. You know, we were expecting claims of about 725,000 per month. That this month last year, we were about $750,000 in claims. So we'll take that as good news, uh, although I will make a note that there's been a change in how Anthem provides its reporting. Um, not just for Cheshire, but for all the um, you know, municipalities and school districts that it serves across Connecticut. And it's requiring us to slightly change the way we uh, reconcile the numbers. So I don't know if that has anything to do with the low claim month. The prior two claim months you know, were relatively higher than expected. Um, so with that caveat, I'll, I'll take it as good news. So. You know, the, um, you know, the end of September, our 
medical trust fund balance actually went up by 213,000 because claims were so far below what were expected and what were budgeted. So we have $3,925,532 in the trust fund. That's 5.4 months in claims reserve. So that's the medical benefits update. We'll take that one every month if we can. Thank you very much. Um, I also understand that we have a uh, proposed bid waiver for transportation. Yes. With our contract with that guy. Oh, I'm sorry. Could we do questions on the budget? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I do like have a question. Ahead. It's okay. I know it's, we're not at the end of October, but uh, I see we're projecting uh, negative $125,000 for pupil services. Is that related to transportation, more or less? No, actually, it's it's related to the um, you know various support services we provide to special education students. So that would be speech, occupational, and consulting services. Um, yes, that is you know projecting over budget at the work over budget. We are trying to watch that carefully, but. Um, you know, unfortunately, what happens as we progress through the year, you wind up with cases that you couldn't anticipate. Yeah, I understand there's, yeah. that, that fluctuates. I know it was uh, increased uh, special needs students coming to the district, or there's some cases where additional support that wasn't planned for. But yeah, I so it's support services, sure. not transportation. Got it. Thank you. More questions? I, oh, I have a question about the medical benefits yes. report. Um, and I don't, so the contributions are sh shown as 2.1 million, but is that just a cumulative number? Yes, 700,000 a month is okay. what's being usually, contributed. Yeah, okay. And that's lower than we had been contributing last year. If you remember, we reduced right. the medical benefits budget. So the contributions every month will be 700,000. Claims are expected to be 725,000 a month. So theoretically, we should be dropping $25,000 per month from the reserve okay thank you um, yeah my, my question is also for the uh, medical benefits trust um, you mentioned that anthem changed their reporting methods uh, so are you saying that they're they they could potentially be under reporting claims I'm saying that I don't know exactly what's happening we used to get a report from anthem with our claims for the month. That was very detailed for the month. They don't r provide that report anymore. I know that sounds crazy for a, a company of its size to do that. So now what you know, our benefits person has to do is literally take the claims week by week and add them up in different categories. We have you know, several different um, claims against each of our different types of plans, our PPO, HMO, HSA, you have major medical claims for hospital, doctor claims, pharmacy claims. So it's created an incredible amount of work. And so what I'm saying is the, the way the reports are coming from Anthem, we may have a, a change in you know, how those, the month began and month ended compared to last year. So it's, it's kind of new, unfortunately. And, and um, I've heard this same report from a bunch of other school districts that are struggling with the same thing. They changed their reporting infrastructure. Go ahead. So are you saying that you were able to reconcile the number? Well, this is the 512-010. That is the claims that have been reported okay. week to week for the month of September. So, and I just wanted to put the caveat out there that I'm not really sure if there's anything else at work. Shouldn't be. Those are the claims. They are ours. But... It's an oddball thing that we're dealing with. Well, I guess we'll just have to keep an eye on it. Then. Well, <laughs> trust me. Yeah. I will. Uh, That's why I wanted to caveat it out there. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I, I see Tony has a question. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not giving you a, a face because you say anything wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as you know, I work for a health insurer, and oh. the whole ASO model, the administrative services, is that whole thing where they provide you to break down by category. They do the work for us. And if not doing that, why do we have them? That's a great question. Oh, we'll take so, it offline. We'll, we'll talk. No, we, we, um, you know, we, didn't, we do have a, a uh, benefits consultant that we use, USI, and this has been a topic of conversation you know, since the beginning of the new fiscal year. And um, one of the things that we are going to do is going out to bid. 
for I, providers. It's, I, being the healthcare industry is rather small industry in Connecticut. You know, I know Anthem's going through a lot of changes, but the ASO model is such that that's the whole point is providing that service so that you don't have to have our staff do that work. And so anyway, well, I just okay. I, I, I get it. I just I put I'm it not looking at you funny because you did anything wrong. I just as I said, for a company like Anthem, I understood to give us less reporting than we ever had in 2018 makes zero sense. And it's not like we haven't taken it up the chain. It's, well, I, I'm still shaking my head in disbelief over it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, DATCO, transportation? DATCO, okay. So I, I provided for the uh, board members a package, and there's, there's four different pieces in this package, but really I can focus everyone's attention on, on the memo and walk through it. This is consistent um, with the information that we had discussed in executive session about a month ago. Um, but there are some updates that I wanted to provide. So in the, in the board members package and in the a package that was handed out tonight, there is the letter from DATCO. And DATCO is proposing a no-bid contract renewal for the Cheshire Public School for five years. And the existing contract with DATCO expires at the end of this fiscal year, so June 30th of, of 2019. If you look at the first page of the memo, there's five basic points in their proposal. Point one is that they would they're offering a five-year agreement beginning July 1st of 2019 and ending June 30th of 2024. Uh, the board is allowed to enter into a contract with transportation companies for five years under Connecticut state law. And that's what we've been doing in prior years. Um, DATCO's proposal with regard to cost is that in the first year of the contract, there would be no change in the cost. So the cost you know, that we have this year would carry into next year. And then in years two through five, their proposal is we would go up 2% per year. And the fourth point that they're offering is that they would replace at no cost to the board the existing trailer where we house our transportation department. Um, and they would not only provide a new trailer, but it would also be larger than the existing one. It would have, you know, two men's rooms and two ladies' rooms instead of the one that we have. The existing trailer facility is old and uh, it is too small for the, for the staff that works there. And when I say the staff, we have three members of Cheshire Public School staff there and DATCO has its dispatcher, its manager, its staff, and the drivers you know, basically come and, and go you know, when they report in the morning and between runs. So those are the basic tenants that they're proposing. If you look towards the bottom of, of page one, what I'm showing in that chart, really I want you to focus on the middle column that says five-year annual increase. So if you look at the contract that we had with DACO from 2009-10 through 2013-14, the average annual increase percentage in that contract was 5.6% per year. So when we started the contract, the bus rate per day was $258. And by the time that contract ended, we were at $301. So 5.6% was the annual increase built into that contract. We went out to bid in 2014. That contract, from an increase point of view, was much better. It was 1.8%. And you could see that in the first year of the contract, our rates dropped 3%. And then the annual increases were 3% per year. So the contract that you're looking at in that middle section is the contract we're in. Based on DATCO's proposal, the annual increase per year is 1.6%. So this would be the, if we, assuming the board agreed to um, allow uh, Jeff and I to go to the town council and present and request a bid waiver, assuming the council approved it, this would be the lowest annual increase per year of the prior two contracts. So from a financial point of view, it's better than the prior two. 
If you flip to page two, there's, I know there's quite a bit of detail in here, but that chart in the middle, you know, what that's intended to illustrate is that the rates that we're paying DACO are competitive. There's a number of school districts that within the last two years have entered into new agreements with different bus providers. So if you look at the column called type one rate, you'll see that the average across all those school districts is $312 per day. Cheshire is at 329 so Cheshire is higher than the average there. But then if you look at the type two rate, the average is 299 and Cheshire is at 269 so we're lower there. The difference between type 1 and type 2, type 1 are the large buses, you know, either 76 or 84 passenger. Type 2 are the smaller vehicles that we use for regular education as well as special education. Okay. Um, so then if you took the average of everyone in this chart's type 1 and type 2 rate, you know, Cheshire comes in at 299 the average is 306. So, you know, the whole point here is to say that the rates we're paying are competitive. We're not at the low end, we're not at the high end. You know, our rates are in line with what other school districts are paying across the state. So we're not in a position where we're, you know, out of the norm. And so the, the bottom of that page, it really I'm trying to, to pull together, you know, all the information. So. If you look at the total cost of the contract for regular ed, special ed transportation for our large buses, our type two smaller buses, and our vans, using DATCO's proposal, the total cost of, the, of those services would be the 13,794,245 in the first bullet. The second bullet, assumes, which I think is a, is a good assumption, and it's our best case, if we do go out to bid and we see a 3% increase from the current year into the first year of a new contract, and then 3% per year after that, that is about where the market is. And, and frankly, I think if we went out to bid, we'd probably wind up a bit higher than that. But if you use a 3% renewal rate, the total cost for those services would be fourteen million four ninety five zero zero five. So the bottom line is, DATCO's proposal would put us in a position where the contract cost increase would be lower than if we went out to bid. You know, you have to accept the assumption that the three percent per year is where we'd be. You know, there's a, a risk associated with going out to bid. Um, there's a chance we would come in lower. I just don't think it's likely. There's a chance we'll come in above the 3%, which is probably more likely. So what that 700,000 doesn't include, though, is a new building, right? Correct. That 700,000 just reflects if we went out and got a 3% increase per year compared to DACO's proposal, which is no increase in year one and then 2% increases per year, the difference between those two contracts would be in our favor to the tune of $700,000. So from a financial point of view, DATCO's proposal makes sense. And my recommendation is just on the basis of their proposal for the cost difference, we should um, go for a bid waiver and accept DATCO's proposal. Beyond that, I think it's a positive step to get a new facility trailer at no cost to the board. Now, if you look at DACO's letter, they would own the trailer. We wouldn't own the trailer. Um, so the, the question will become in five years, assuming we were to go forward and get this approved and sign an agreement with DACO, is what happens at the end of five years if we don't renew with DACO or if we go out to bid and somebody else wins the bid. One of two things would happen. DACO would either sell the trailer to whoever the next winning bidder or contractor is, or they would haul it off and we would build the cost of, a, of a, another trailer into the next contract. Um, obviously, DACO is interested in 
and having us stay with them. You know, the investment in the trailer is, is probably about $200,000 all in. So um, the recommendation I'm, I'm putting in front of you tonight is the result of, you know, discussions over the past year with Don DeVivo, who's the president of DATCO, and Rob Cleveland, who's their chief financial officer. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that when we started these discussions, their proposal was higher. So, you know, over the course of the discussions, you know, we came down to uh, a proposal that they put forth that, you know, I, I think is very, very reasonable for us because, it, it, in my opinion, if we went out to bid, we would, we would pay higher, even though DACO might win, which they did the last two times. Um, it would make sense for us to take advantage of this opportunity. I don't think we'll do better. And that is the decision point, you know, for the board tonight. The rest of the documents that I included are really incorporated in, into the memo. So they, you know, they don't add anything further than what I've said. There is the survey that I used to create that chart on the second page. Thank you. Yes. So do we own the current trailer? Uh, we do. And it's, um, you know, I'm not sure of the exact age of that trailer. It's probably in the vicinity of 25 years plus. Um, but it's ready to be replaced. And it has no, it has no value. It, it's it's going to be scrapped, hauled, you know, scrapped and hauled off in pieces. Would they pay for that? The removal of the trailer? Yeah, yeah that's, that's part of the, the deal. They take away the old one and they would install a new one at their cost. Um, the, the fees that were being charged, um, what does that include and does that include fuel costs? I, know, I think maybe I asked yeah. that before, but. The, the, the fee that I'm quoting, so just to, um, just to pick one, so right now, the, the large bus, we pay $329 per day. That's the price we pay DACO. And then if you do that times 180 days, that's 59220 We have 31 type 1 buses. So that fee includes DACO providing the bus, providing the driver, providing all the maintenance associated with that bus, providing... Uh, at least two backup buses for each vehicle type. So if a bus doesn't start in the morning, we can still, you know, have the runs and, and pick up and deliver our students. Um, it does, so it includes everything, as well as the driver, but not fuel. Fuel we pay for separately, that's not included in the DATCO contract. We budget that on our own line. And a good portion of the reason why we do provide fuel is because we can buy the fuel without paying any taxes. Um, you know, so if we had DACO provide the fuel, we'd be paying the taxes, not DACO. I think it's self-evident. Um, so it is all-inclusive. It includes, obviously, whatever staff they have to, you know, dispatch and, and manage their fleet. Insurance, as part of the um, contract with DACO, you know, whether we go out to bid or whether we don't, they, there is an insurance requirement that they must meet. So, you know, just, the, I don't remember all the numbers. I believe it's a $10 million general liability policy. Um, they do also have to provide, you know, protection for any kind of molestation or, you know, other things that, you know, would occur. All scout spelled out in the schedule that our insurance agent you know, reviews and, and we're required to ask DACO to provide that. And they, obviously, they have. Um, are there any, um, do they guarantee a, uh, a certain uh, age or quality of bus? And uh, if there were any um, costs that weren't currently foreseen, like let's say a seatbelt law was passed, would that sort of cost to outfit the entire fleet of buses, is that something that would be passed on to us or is that, locked in for the five years if they had to do, if that was mandated? Uh, um, so any, any incremental costs that are required by the state on the bus company, 
you know, would, would be their cost. It wouldn't be our cost. You know, just like any um, change in minimum, minimum wage laws or benefits requirements, that would all be on, on DATCO. You know, and that's one of the things that, you know, to me, you know, the current environment, um, you know, if we're going into an inflationary period, you know, that would only tend to be reflected if we were go out, if we were to go out to bid at this, you know, particular point in time. Um, did I answer all parts of your question? So just just to be clear, like if there if we did have to outfit for seat belts or some other safety concern, that's this is locked in for the for at least the five years. Yeah. If they have Again, to incur that. Any um, sort of state mandate. If it's a state mandate on the bus company, it would be up to them. If it were a mandate on the school district, you know, that might be something that we would have to negotiate. So I, I'm just being careful about the answer because I guess it depends. Oh, yeah, there's a distinction. On, so. on how the law, you know, would be written. And the, the buses themselves, uh, to, I, I did miss part of your question. So in the current contract, which we wouldn't change if we had entered a new contract, the average bus fleet age has to be seven years. Um, and, you know, the, the important thing that, you know, we do do with DACO is do, we do require spares. So, you know, if there's a problem with a bus, we don't skip a beat in the morning. They're responsible to have, you know, that, those spares. They have a mechanic on duty um, so that we, again, don't wind up in a situation where we can't run out buses. They provide snow clearing services. Again, none of that's incremental. They already do that, you know. So really the, the, the question at hand, you know, with respect to the bid waiver, nothing else that we're getting from DATCO changes. It's just a question of, you know, the price uh, going forward for five years. So everything we currently have, we're keeping that. Now, the buses do include GPS um, on all the buses so they can be tracked, not only where they are, but speed that they're traveling so that actually is is helpful to us, uh, and they also include surveillance cameras in the buses. Thank you. Sure. I think additionally, the level of service that we've you know, received over the last decade has been very strong. Um, not that there's never an issue with the bus, but they're always very quick to accommodate, and as Vince said, with spares on hand, the service that we receive, the work, the coordination with their uh, dispatch has been top rate, um, so the service is there as well. Yeah, and I, I did um, I, I did skip that. It is in the memo, but we've been um, with DATCO as a service provider since 1995. You know, from a non-financial point of view, they've been a, a very good provider. They've been responsive if there are issues, and and very responsive when there are issues with drivers in particular. So, you know, we're you know, satisfied with the local staff, the dispatcher, you know, that they have that works with our transportation coordinator, uh, has been there for probably four years now. She's excellent. So the relationship we have with DATCO um, enables us to get things done. Sometimes that extraordinary during the course of a day, you have, you know, a student pickup that, you know, has to be done that was unexpected. Um, you know, between DATCO and, and our, our staff, we got the job done. So, you know, clearly we wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be putting forward this recommendation if I didn't feel wholeheartedly that, you know, DATCO would continue to provide us the kind of service that they've been providing. So just to follow up on the previous question that I had about the trailer, so if we went to a new provider, um, would we probably have to make upgrades to this trailer anyway? Is it an additional cost as well if you're saying it's yeah, Yes, this has, been, this has been a long time in discussion, the upgrade of the trailer. Um, I, if you ever want to take a tour, um, I, will, I, will, I will be glad to show you. You will not be impressed. Um, and it's too small for the number of, you know, drivers and staff that we have. We have only one men's room, one ladies' room. And if you just, you know, we've got 50 drivers, you know, for all the vehicles. Think about it in the morning. You know, everybody has their coffee. 
You've got 50 people, you know, waiting to start their runs, and although they're staggered a little bit, you have lines of people waiting. So this is a big improvement. Now, you know, honestly, DACO, the improvement is, is great for the DACO staff as well. So it does benefit DACO to have better facility, right? It helps them with their driver tenure and, and overall employee satisfaction. So, you know, it is, you know, self-serving may be a bad word because I don't intend it to be a bad word, but it, it helps them. It, it's better condition for their staff as well. So, yes, if you're interested in, just give me a call. We'll take a ride down. Or you can stop in on Sandback Road and, and look for Luther Miller. He'll be glad to show you. I've around. been in there before. My son's forgotten something. Okay. But, um, so it, but that's just an additional cost we would have. In addition to the, the bid, is we would have to do something with the trailer in addition to that. Right. Presumably, if we went out, let's say we were going out to bid, and wouldn't, you know, again, there's a lot of assumptions here. The board approves and the council approves. But if we do wind up going out to bid for this contract, we will specify that we want a, you know, a new trailer facility in the, in the bid, and of course that will be incorporated into the price. You're welcome. Anybody else? I know past performance in history is not indicative of future um, outcomes, but I just want to bid waiver has always been um, funny to me was what happened many years ago wasn't and I should know this I think it's when I first got on the board but I think there was a situation where at the time it was probably eight nine years ago we did recommend a bid waiver it was rejected went out the bid and the cost came back as yeah. an increase of about four hundred thousand well it's it's actually in that chart on page one so if you look at the 2009 oh, the 10 increase, that's yeah, it. the 12, yeah. what happened, it's my understanding, because that was just before um, I became the business You're manager here. You were being interviewed at the time that happened, believe it or yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, so the recommendation, I, I believe Dr. Florio's um, was able to negotiate a contract at uh, 4% yes. per year. Correct. And the um, bid waiver was not approved at the town council level. And so it went out to bid, DACA won. But the first year increase, instead of being 4%, was 12%. And so, yes, I, I believe I know there those, was were, a, those were 10 years ago. I, I remember right. that. But, I mean, there's always that risk. I'm not saying that will happen, but it's good to have that perspective. We've been through this right. a few times. Right. And, you know, bid waivers, you know, it's, it's never an easy ask. You know, there's, there's pros and cons. Um, but it's not, a, it, it's not something that I look at the proposals that, that has been made. I, I certainly think it's worth pursuing you know and I hope we can get it approved because I don't believe we'll do better thank you I just I need to point out what I think is probably just a clerical error okay um, if you look at the years in the first column um, when you get to the proposed five-year contract extension you skipped a year. Oh, I did so it should only go out to 2024. Yes. Thank you. So it should be 1920, 2021, 22, 23. Yes. Yeah, so it's yeah, the yeah. second one. It, it, it comes out to 2024. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Um, anybody else? Uh, with that, well, I do want to say, I do want to point out myself, there's something to be said for having a continuing local relationship for over 15 years yeah. with one group who really knows the town. And to be able to get a, what sounds certainly like a good bid proposal, it, it says something about the relationships between the two parties. Yeah. Um, with that. Uh, I move that the Cheshire Board of Education request the Town Council waive the bidding requirements so that a new agreement can be executed with DATCO in accordance with their proposal dated October 10th, 2018, to provide transportation services to, the che to Cheshire Public Schools for the period from July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2024, 
with annual escalations of 0%, 2%, 2%, 2%, and 2%. Thank you, Ms. Sobel. Is there a second? Ms. Harrigan? Is there any discussion? Have we discussed? Okay. So the motion before us is that the Cheshire Board of Education request the Town Council waive the bidding requirements so that a new agreement can be executed with DATCO in accordance with their proposal dated October 10, 2018 to provide transportation services to the Cheshire Public Schools for the period from July 1, 2019 to June 30, 2024 with annual, annual escalations of 0%, 2%, 2%, and 2%. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sobel. Anything Thank else? You. I believe that is it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, planning committee. That would be me usually. So, Mr. Massiano, can you just explain the uh, requirements for approval of educational specifications? Yes. Thank you. I'll make this one quicker, hopefully. So, we have to replace the underground oil storage tank at Doolittle. Uh, that project is eligible for a construction grant from the Department of Administrative Services. Uh, we would be in reimbursed 40 percent of eligible costs. In order to apply for the grant, one of the requirements is the approval by the Board of Education of the educational specs. I believe we did this for Darcy not that long ago. Um, so the the educational specifications in this case are, are, are pretty easy. And page two, the project purpose is to replace the underground storage tank that is approaching the end of its 30-year useful life and must be replaced in accordance with DEEP requirements. So this, this particular task required of the board would go in with our application package with copies of the certified resolutions from the town council appropriating the funds which they have previously um, and also other resolutions that the council would would pass um, allowing this project to um, go to the, the design stage and ultimately go to bid. So this is a requirement to get at state funding for the project. We um, are anticipating doing this this coming summer um, but we have till the following summer if, if we needed to push it out. And we do have to replace the tank at Doolittle because there is no other option. There is no national natural gas in the area of Doolittle. So the state requires us to replace it, and we're going to try and get reimbursed for it. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Perugini, do you have a motion? Madam Chair, I do have a motion that the Cheshire <coughs> Board of Education approves the educational specifications for the code violation for underground storage tank replacement project at Doolittle School. Further, that the board authorizes the administration to submit the appropriate documentation for a grant application with the Connecticut Department of Administrative Services Office of School Construction. Thank you, Mr. Perugini. Do we have a second? Ms. Sobel, any discussion, questions? Okay, so the motion before us is that the Cheshire Board of Education approves the educational specifications for the code violation for underground storage tank replacement project at Doolittle School. Further, that the board authorizes the administration to submit the appropriate documentation for a grant application with the Connecticut Department of Administrative Services Office of School Construction. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, well, I just had a quick question. Um, you said that the uh, the cost was half a million. Was that is this one of those? No, the, this tank replacement. Yeah. Um, probably in the neighborhood of one hundred fifty to two hundred. Okay, so it would fall underneath the uh, uh, threshold for any kind of um, referendum. Referendum. Yeah. yeah, and the money's already the money's already uh, appropriated. Okay. So, yeah, right. there's no there's no funding requirement. It's already right. set aside. Thank you. State the motion, or can we just vote on it? We um, you've already stated it, so right. Okay. So yeah. Do you want me to do? Okay. All right. Um, all those in favor? <laughs> it is unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> Jeez, I'm. 
Ms. Vadi, do you have a report for us from policy? Uh, I do, thank you. So the policy committee um, reviewed uh, or and was putting forward five policies for first reading tonight. Um, one is just a revised policy and that's policy 6142, instruction, basic instruction. So Mr. Parkhurst introduced the revisions to this policy to bring it up to date and to align it with our current practice. The changes reflect the subject matter that has been added to our curriculum due to changes in legislation but was not previously reflected in the written policy. The um, other four policies that we're bringing forward for first reading are all required by law. Um, number one is 5125.11, health slash medical records. This policy states that when applicable, district schools will comply with HIPAA to maintain the privacy of protective health, protected health information that it receives, obtains, transmits, or sends. The Director of uh, Pupil Personnel Services is designated as the HIPAA Privacy Officer. The policy also states that student education records, including personally identifiable health information maintained by the district, is subject to and protected by the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is FERPA. The policy also states that the district will seek Medicaid eligibility information to determine if services to a student may be billed. The district will comply with HIPAA's electronic transactions requirements. Once again, that was pursuant to legislation that we're just putting into policy. Um, the second new policy, again, that is uh, statutorily manda mandated um, that we're putting into policy would be 5144.4 student discipline physical exercise. This policy states that school employees may not prevent a student in elementary school from participating in recess or in other sustained opportunities for physical activity during classroom learning as a form of discipline. School employees may not require students enrolled in grades K through 12 inclusive to engage in physical activity as a form of discipline during the school day. School employees shall not prevent students from participating in physical exercise during wellness instruction as a form of discipline. The next new policy is 6161.3 instruction. Um, comparability of services for Title I schools. Again, this is also uh, legislatively mandated that we're putting into policy. This new required policy states that no discrimination occurs in the, distribu in the distribution, <laughs> sorry, distribution of resources funded by state and local sources regardless of the receipt of federal funds. The fourth new policy is 6171.2 instruction preschool students with disabilities. Mr. Parker shared this new required policy and noted it be reviewed by Dar noted it had been reviewed by Darcy school principal and Donnery and also the director of pupil personnel services. This policy states the board shall maintain an early intervention program for preschool aged children identified through the birth to age three screening process under regulations imposed by the Individuals with Disabilities Act, which identifies children with special education needs or developmental delays. The policy lists the administrative practices and procedures of the program. So it's our recommendation um, that the Cheshire Board of Education give a first reading to policies 5125.1 5144, 6142, 6161.3, and 6171.2. Thank you, Ms. Fadi. Is there any questions about any of the policies? I, I just have a quick question. Um, so the, the first one that's listed here, the 5125, the health medical records, did we not, we didn't already have like compliance with HIPAA regulations? So what I will say about the, um, the new policies, the new law, yeah. that was a result of the audit that we had done on our policy over the summer. So those were ones that we've been, had the practice in place, we just didn't have a written policy. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Ms. Vadi. We're going to defer the report on the calendar committee until next month's meeting. Right? 
Uh, is there anyone from the public that would like to address the Board, board of Education? Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't believe the chair has any old business. Anyone else have any old business? Mr. Grippo. I just had a question on, I guess, on my committee, the, uh, the uh, calendar committee. Um, uh, we had, uh, Jeff and I had discussed, so there does not need to be, because I thought that the calendar committee already exists, so we don't need a formation of it. And then, or how, how is that working? Because we deferred report, so. Yeah, usually the chair appoints that committee. Um, okay. And so we're going to defer that until next meeting. And then the, the calendar committee will meet to design the calendar for the right. next, or adopt the calendar, hopefully, for the next uh, academic year. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Perugini. Yeah, I, I, when you were talking about the school buses, Vincent, it reminded me of something. Uh, and if you don't have it for this meeting, maybe for the next one, I just I, when the school year started and, you know, the buses are out there, you know, people were, were reporting, people not stopping for the school buses and the question about how many cameras we have out there. What's, if there's any uh, report update on this year, how many school buses are running with the cameras to catch people passing them, if we had any incidents and how many fines have been given out to date, um, just to get an idea. I, I, I reassure parents that, you know, it's always reinforced, it's always enforced, be it the bus drivers for the police, et cetera, cameras, but, you know, it's been a while since we talked about that would be nice to get some numbers around that. I, I will bring an update to the next board meeting. Okay, okay. And, um, you know, there are two buses that, have, that are equipped with those cameras that would, you know, basically they would capture someone passing a stop school bus illegally and issue a fine. So the program still is in place, yep. and it is working, but I will get an update. I'd be curious. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I believe we have a piece of new business, which is approval of ED-099 Agreement for Child Nutritional Programs. Is that you, Mr. Massiana? Thank you. I'll take it if you'd like. Yes, please. Okay. The board members have heard me say in the past that school nutrition is a very technical area, and um, if you had a chance to look at this 15-page ED-099 agreement, I, it's hard to miss the number of technicalities and laws, but you know, I will, I will summarize what this is. This is a form that we've, we've signed in the past. It needs to be updated periodically, which is the reason that it's before the board again this evening. Essentially, what uh, we signed this agreement for is so that we can participate in the programs that are outlined in the, in the cover memo. The school district does participate in the National School Lunch Program the school breakfast program, and the food distribution program. Each of those programs do provide reimbursement to the school district for certain things. So the school, National School Lunch Program, um, if students take an eligible meal, we get reimbursed 21 cents. If the student is on free or reduced lunch, we get reimbursed just about the full cost of the meal, which is $3. And a meal has to have all the various components on the tray. So not to get into the weeds too much. In order for us to continue to get those reimbursements and participate in the program, the board has to agree to the ED-099 because Jeff and I are authorized to submit those reimbursements that we receive that you know, help supplement the cost of running our uh, school lunch program. So that's the, that covers school lunch and the school breakfast program. Food distribution program, which is offered by the U United States Department of Agriculture, that's a little bit different, um, although the formula is based on the number of students, uh, I believe, that are on free and reduced. We get an allotment every year from the USDA, you know, Basically, it's not an allotment of cash. It's an allotment of spending dollars that we can use to buy um, chicken, beef, uh, fresh produce, um, canned fruits and vegetables as well. So we get about $110,000 worth of commodity items from the USDA every year through this program. So 
essentially the board needs to you know, approve the agreement so that we can continue to participate in the program, get our reimbursement, and also receive our commodities from the USDA. Thank you, Mr. Massan. Is This is an agreement for just this and I apologize if you already said this, this school year? It, it's actually ongoing until it's changed again. Oh, okay. So, okay. We, you know, again, this comes up uh, periodically, but not annually. Okay, thank you. Mr. Grippo? Um, would you happen to know, is this the only agreement that we have that would require us to be Title VI compliant? I do not know the answer to that question. Just curious. I can find... <laughs> I can find that out. So it's a big, it's a big requirement. Yeah. So I was just wondering if this was the only. I, I would suspect not, but you know. As I said, very technical. So I'll get you that answer, and I can email the answer to to you. And I appreciate that. As well. Thanks. Ms. Harrigan, do you have a motion for us? Sure. I move that the Cheshire Board of Education approves the permanent single agreement ED. 099 agreement for child nutrition programs. Thank you. Is there a second? Ms. Sobel. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before us is that the Cheshire Board of Education approves the permanent single agreement ED 099 agreement for child nutrition programs. All those in favor? It is unanimous, thank you. Is there any other new business? I have a piece of new business. Yeah. <coughs> um, just briefly, I would like to introduce uh, a forum that we attended last Tuesday. And I won't go into a lot of details, but it's something that I think we will be hearing more of as we go along. And so I'd just like to uh, introduce the topic tonight. Um, myself and uh, Superintendent Solon and principal of the high school, Dr. Mary Gadd, attended a forum on Tuesday, October 16th, so this past Tuesday, up at Trinity College on um, later school start times for middle and high schools. Uh, there was a lot of information. We went to breakout sessions after uh, some keynote speakers. and. Um, there's a lot of compelling evidence that uh, our, adoles our adolescents in the United States of America are s quite sleep deprived. And it's, this is a health epidemic and uh, one way to uh, solve this problem is to uh, implement later start times for adolescents. So um, I will, I can go into some details later. We also are talking about providing some of that information uh, to our community. And uh, I just wanted people to know there will be more on this uh, as we uh, move forward with this, uh, talking about this topic. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Harrigan. Anyone else? Ms. Sobel. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to, uh, take a moment and talk about the Cheshire Food Drive, which is going to be going on uh, the first weekend in November, November 3rd and 4th, on the, in front of the First Congregational Church Green. Um, that, is a, that is a program run by Cheshire Food Drive, Inc., which organizes, it's town-wide, it's annual. We start, well, the Food Drive starts collections in the elementary schools, the middle school, the high school, for food um, donations. This year we're very lucky. We'll, Dodd Middle School will uh, actually be having a bus uh, to bring their food donations. Last year when we picked it up, there were so many donations. It took a number of people, a number of trips back and forth, which was a fabulous problem to have. Um, and we're really excited to be able to have a, a larger vehicle to do that. Um, also in the high school, we collect monetary as well as, as food donations. Um, we also collect food uh, at local businesses and in front of Stop and Shop 
um, on November 3rd and 4th. Uh, and we also collect monetary donations to fund the town's food voucher program. The food voucher program is administered by uh, the town's social services. They are, they sort of work like gift cards for food items of a person's choice. They can be redeemed at either Stop and Shop or Big Y, and then the bill for that goes directly to Cheshire Food Drive, Inc. Um, you do not have to use the food pantry to get a food voucher. They are not related at all. Um, and there are many people who sometimes just find that they need a little extra help, um, especially with winter coming. Uh, and these vouchers can be used on an emergency basis as well as an ongoing basis. Um, so we're very excited on Cheshire Food Driving to, to be ready for the food drive. We take volunteers on the green all day, nine to three. Um, and I'm sure all of you will be getting my letter soon, if you haven't already. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you. And it really is, it, it's, it's personal to me, but it's also, uh, it's a great opportunity for the entire town to come together. We get volunteers on the green from, you know, we get little kids who can barely reach the table. We get seniors. Um, Elam Park is very active in it. And it's, it's very enjoyable to have the town come together and do something easy and simple and help feed their neighbors. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sobel. <clears throat> Anybody else? No. Uh, before I call for a motion to adjourn, I'd like to just read the upcoming meetings. On November 1st at 7.30 p.m. is the Board of Education Elementary School Showcase, one of the greatest it's always a fun event. That'll be at Chap Chapman Elementary School. November 5th at 6.30 is policy committee meeting at the Humiston Boardroom. November 12th at 7 p.m. curriculum committee meeting at the Humiston Boardroom. And November 15th at 7.30 is the Board of Education business meeting here in Town Hall. Um, school events, November 6th is election day, no school for students, although it's a professional development day, everyone go out and vote. November 13th is the school business partnership career day at Cheshire High School. November 14th, as uh, Superintendent Solon mentioned, is the CAP Superintendent's Award at 6 p.m. at Dodd Middle School. November 16th, 17th is the C Cape CAPS convention and the Thanksgiving break is November 22nd through 23rd. Um, and the first budget meeting, I'm not going to read all of them, but as Superintendent Solon mentioned, his presentation of the budget will be at uh, Dodd Middle School, 7.30 p.m. on January 8th, 2019. Can't believe we're already doing budgets. Um, and with that, I will call for a motion to adjourn. Ms. Sobel, second. Anyone? Ms. Vadi, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you so much.